Okay, do you want my background? I'm a, I'm a no. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the way the way the supply chain works is it's not state bordered. This would have national implications. You have retail pharmacies who have over 7,000 chain members across the country. An advanced price notification would have a result in those chain pharmacies being able to order products across the country. Texas, Illinois, Florida, other states in the country could get excess products, and that could cause shortages in the state of California and elsewhere. So the bottom line is patient access could be compromised. The supply chain is not, is not um, set up to, to respond to demand that's not consistent, and that's exactly what would happen with a 30-day notification. I had a conversation a week ago with a senior executive at one of the largest wholesalers located just a little southwest of this location, and they said even a two-day advance notice causes challenges for them to have proper supply for their downstream customers. So 30 days would be excessive. But I still don't think that answers the question of production, because if a manufacturer isn't producing enough and there's a shortage and they have the ability to produce more, I think they have an obligation to do so to provide the supply chain to whether it's the country or the state. And I, you did specifically ask for production. You made a comment that you thought the federal government limited on their production to a product, which I don't know. I still don't have an answer to that. Any well, other? can someone provide an answer for that? Do you have an answer to that question? So as far as we have to file months and sometimes years in advance for lot sizes or regulations for quality control for manufacturing, so that we can't just turn on a dime and have a new product put out that's in short supply. This requires advanced notification with the FDA. So that would that there's not a, an ability to just have a product that's running in short supply for a particular lot size, a particular dosage form, and just have our production facilities in the U.S. or globally turn on a dime and have that increased production if, to have a supply when the demand is not consistently being generated. So how, how long? Go ahead, if I may. Yeah. How long of a delay would that contribute to the FDA approval? Well, the, the FDA, I'm assuming no. the FDA approval is first and then the production occurs after. I couldn't predict that. It would be right, really dependent on But you've had experience product. doing that. I've had so. experience. We've had experience with one of our own products during the flu season. A product was for pneumococcal vaccinations. It was a product that was on the market. A change in thought leader recommendations caused a dramatic increase in the demand nationally for that product. There was one particular large national retailer that continued to buy a particular dosage form of that product, which resulted in an outage of that for a given period of time. So that's with a product that we already know a consistent demand. You, that's, so any change in demand, whether it be price related or whether it be a recommendation change or a labeling change, creates this type of situation, which ultimately comes back to a challenge for patients in this state having access, whether it be a, a major retail uh, pharmacy that's a national chain or possibly an independent pharmacy as well. You know, again, I don't want to. I definitely don't want to cut you off, Mr. Nazarian. Having said that, <laughs> if you still, you know, if you still have questions that they can assist you in answering, then then proceed. But if if it's not moving forward, I also want to give. I mean, we've got, we do have other items, and I do we do have a motion and a second. So if if this is helping you develop your thoughts, you know, you know, please continue. It is because it's uh, it's there's. You know, this is this is uh, um, uh, unfortunately yeah, it's a lot of information is left out, and you're trying to figure out how you can best address the issue when there are many unknowns. I I'm still not certain about what the FDA's role does in potentially uh, commingled with the state's role, uh, uh, creating a whole new other market that will potentially even impact higher prices on, on the consumers. I mean, we, we don't really know that outcome. And that's where my concern is. That's where I've been hesitant about this, uh, about this issue. And I appreciate but, and understand your concerns. Thank you for asking them. Thank you. You bet. Any for Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Gomez? Thank you so much. Um, this, uh, I appreciate people, uh, members and uh, senators, bringing bills forward because it often f focuses our attention on issues that are uh, critical to, um, the, to the public. Uh, and it actually forces us to actually really dig deep into this issue. Uh, if we just go by the fact that just what the bill says, that's one thing. Um, I like to use this because uh, this statement 
because it was actually used against me on one of my bills. It's not just what the bill says, but what it doesn't say, right? Um, and that's uh, something that I want to focus on is kind of the entire marketplace. Because I started doing research on this, it is a very complex industry. Um, to an extent that, um, you know, Harvard uh, School of Public Policy had a forum that discussed uh, drug pricing and drug costs and what does that mean. Um, there's numerous articles written about it. It is a hot political issue. It's an issue that people have um, been talking about since uh, before the Affordable Care Act. Since 2000, even um, in 2004, it was a hot presidential issue. But uh, I like to try to take a, um, a holistic approach because this, this marketplace is complex. Um, one article said, blaming any one group or industry regarding uh, rising drug costs is not a useful exercise. All right? And that was actually from a, a managed care um, website by a former uh, pharmacy benefit manager. Um, it would be easy to kind of say that the pharmaceuticals are the ones to blame for everything, but it was the system that has been created by the, a lot of the laws that were passed at the federal level. One that it, um, it creates incentives that you have higher costs, um, brand names, and on patent drugs, and then you have cheaper um, generic drugs. And it was a, decisions that were made by the federal government. Um, the Affordable Care Act has changed a lot of this dynamic. Um, one of the Harvard professors actually said, um, consumers and patients are getting great value from pharmaceuticals and are also getting ripped off. Yet, they can't tell the difference when which is occurring. Because some drugs, you know, if you were saying a drug was $1,000 but it was going to extend your life for how, many, for how many years, would we pay for it? Yes. If we're saying that a drug that's similar to some other drug but is actually getting charged a greater markup than a particular drug when you can actually go and get that generic or that other off-patent drug, then you might be getting ripped off. But the public really can't tell the, the difference when it comes to this issue. Um, even a report by the Warren School of Business says, um, I want to kind of just read this. There are um, each stage of the supply chain, and this is why the supply chain matters, incurs costs and adds a markup or margin to cover these costs. So when you do not look at the manufacturing, the wholesalers, the PBMs, and the health plans, you're really not getting, and the pharmacies, you're not really getting a, a complete picture when it comes to how we end up with these drug prices. So um, I had a couple of concerns. This is kind of, you forced me to actually try to do some research independently because um, people always tell you, uh, uh, you know, they're own perspective without ever saying, yeah, you're, you're right. Um, if, um, if it wasn't a lucrative business, then we wouldn't have all these individuals in this room. That's just the nature of uh, man, uh, the marketplace as we speak. A um, couple of questions. One, when you give the 30-day notice before an increase, you're inherently giving advance notice to the benefit managers, right? To go and get and leverage as many discounts and rebates as possible, or to cut deals or to plan if you're a health trust on how you could absorb those costs. Um, what kind of, and this is for both sides of the argument, what kind of um, ripple effect will we have on the entire US pharmaceutical marketplace when it comes to um, this bill and when it comes to um, uh, uh, brand name, patent drugs, as well as generics. When it comes to generics, um, I have a question is why they are actually included. Um, I've read studies that generics actually cost less here than in other countries. They might be paying less for those brand names, but uh, generics actually cost less. And it is actually, according to another report, as a, um, large generic firms also often distribute generics directly to large pharmacies, eliminating the wholesaler role. As a result of direct generic discounting, the average wholesale price is a poor indicator of actual acquisition cost to the pharmacy. 
A recent CBO report, Congressional Budget Office report, found discounts to pharmacies on generics can exceed 80 to 90 percent of the average whole, uh, wholesale pr uh, price, list price. Um, just want to kind of understand basically what we're going to have impacting the, the generics, um, what, how is it going to the, the role of the entire marketplace. Um, those are just a few questions. It's, uh, you want to write a paper? Um, I, maybe I'll have the sponsors try to uh, answer that. May I respond to, to the yeah. answer? Well, he asked the question. Oh. You know, it, who do you want to First answer? this side, then the next side. Uh, Beth Capel on behalf of Health Access California. First to note that the advance notice with respect to generic supplies to generics that cost more than $100 for a 30-day supply or per course of treatment. This obviously does not reflect the, the entire generic market, but only the most expensive drugs in it. And a, to our astonishment, there are drugs that are over $100 that are generics now. So it's an important piece that we are looking at the, the high cost end of that. Um, with respect to the impact, um, the opportunity for everyone to understand the implications of the price increases, um, if one of the benefits of this bill is that across this country, purchasers are able to have the time to do as you said, to know what the price is, to negotiate, to consider the impact on formularies, to budget, to plan, to search for alternatives. Um, we often think of California as a leader. Um, we had not thought of it as a benefit of this bill that we would lead uh, so directly on this issue. Can I just add this very broad on behalf of the Teamsters? The direct answer is if you go to the Teamsters Trust Fund and some drug gets raised by, well, we're in Stockholm Syndrome, so if they just double it, you know, that's like nothing. But if it goes by, up by 300 or 400 percent, um, and we say there's an alternative drug that's cheaper, that's just as effective, we're striking it from our formulary next month. And if we do that, and Blue Cross does that, and Kaiser does that, and PERS does that, that may modify that price for that pharmaceutical company, and that's what they're afraid of. That's, they're not here opposing this bill because it's going to raise the price of drugs and make them more profitable. It's because it's going to make the market more competitive, and that's exactly what this bill will do. Mr. Gomez, with regard to your question about generic industry, as currently written, and we've, we've discussed extensively with the uh, author and sponsors, generic manufacturers literally do not know what their price is going to be from day to day because they are pricing it at different levels. Like a commodities market, we don't set a price and then say this is our price. We respond on for a whole different host of reasons. So we cannot comply with a 30-day advance notice. What would happen, and even for the higher cost generic drugs that are, would be included, as uh, Ms. Capel mentioned, of $100, um, let's say that the bill were to be enacted, then generics would need to provide notice every time they comply with changes in the market going that are increasing, but then there's no commensurate benefit for when the prices decrease. Now, we're not asking to notify for when the prices decrease because they do fluctuate. But in the last eight, eight years, uh, studies by the federal government and by major PBMs have indicated that the average cost of generic drugs over eight years has decreased roughly 60 percent. So that's a trend that should be encouraged rather than uh, having this complication affect them. And Mr. Chair, on the, on the branded side, you know, I know, uh, Mr. Gomez, you know this bill very well, and what's being required to be reported is, the, is an increase in the wholesale acquisition cost, the sticker price for the drug, and very few payers pay that price. So most, most large negotiations with large purchasers have a contract. And if, and if a price were to go up, the contract will prevail during that period. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, this is a, uh, a complicated bill, um, no doubt about it. It's a complicated market. Um, I believe that there might be some, uh, you, we suspect that it will allow in the um, better negotiations of prices, right? At first I was told it's just a simple transparency bill. And then I was like, mm, 
it didn't smell like a simple uh, transparency bill. In the end, the market responds to where it can make the most money. And the organizations, different organizations and entities will grow. I believe, um, you know, you have some growing entities as PBMs that are going to be playing a larger and larger role. If you have your own PBM in your health plan or your trust, you're in good shape. If you're actually using a PBM, uh, that's a, a different story. Uh, I think in the end, you might have a new market player, a greater with greater strength, that um, you really do not know where it's going to go when it comes to those 30-day advance notice, what kind of ripple effect it's going to have. Um, but not every bill is um, perfect. Uh, I believe that if you take it uh, to the floor um, with 30 days, uh, in the assembly, not the Senate, in the assembly, uh, it's going to be very, very uh, dicey. Um, just knowing having bills lost and fought, transparency bills that had no direct cost, that um, were less intrusive, um, these, these fights um, are very unpredictable. Um, I believe in the end, even getting the, the budgets when it comes to um, advertising would be a huge win. Getting some of those other factors, the 25 most prescribed drugs would be um, also important factors. Um, another reason is because what we discovered over time is even just the increased prescription of drugs actually increases the cost eventually to go up. Or the changing of, you know, high blood pressure was here before, now that's actually you have to have a lower benchmark, more people come in. The Affordable Care Act uh, uh, Medi-Cal here in California has gr brought in tons of new patients, right, with um, untreated issues. And that is going to create a demand that a lot of us probably didn't suspect. So I know why you're trying to curb some of these costs. Um, I think you have some concerns throughout the, the bill, and I'm not sure if you're going to... Um, if you can keep those in, this is just my advice. You're going to have some probably some issues on, on the floor. Um, I'll listen to the rest of the testimony and then I'll make a decision. Thank, thank you. Any further questions or comments from? <laughs> I'm trying to avoid eye contact with Mr. Nazarian. Uh, <laughs> I'm so glad your eyes say yes. <laughs> okay, Mr. Nazarian. All right, Mr. Broad, you uh, started talking about how if CalPERS, if uh, your trust, if several other big trusts and plans uh, start boycotting, in essence, uh, or, or whatever it is, dropping the drug from the formulary, uh, that then the prices will be not exorbitant exorbitantly increased. Well, why not just do that now? Why do you need a notification process? in order to get to that. Can't you just do that now? Well, we have patients taking those drugs. We have to have some ability to respond to an ability to look at what the factors are that are involved, whether it's a reasonable price increase or not. Um, it, it's, it simply allows us the ability to look at the market and respond rationally. But not, not. We don't want to simply say you can't take that drug anymore. Things have to be phased and so forth. But we, I can tell you from a real example, on one of the major drugs, I believe it was one of the hepatitis drugs. There was time, they ultimately went to a competitor and got one of the generic manufacturers to make an alternative that considerably lowered the price. Maybe it wasn't the hepatitis, it was a, Steropril. one of the, yeah. Steropril. Yeah, Steropril. And went to an alternative where they could get another manufacturer to make the drug and it significantly lowered the price. We want to have those opportunities in the marketplace. This is just about information so that we can bargain better. And on behalf of our members, and employers can bargain on behalf of their employees and plans on behalf of their members. That's all it is, is information. But let me, let me, one has nothing to do with the other. You can have that practice in place right now. And that's what I'm trying to get an answer for the question. I love what almost the entirety of what this bill does. 
I do appreciate about the disclosure aspect of it. I just don't understand how notifying, how a notification process is going to help with transparency when all it does is make it harder for the supplier of, of a product to have to shift on a dime when it's got so many FDA requirements over how to, it even stores drugs, let alone at what temperatures it has to produce them. I'm not trying to defend that industry, but but you know when it already has to go through all the diff challenges in order to try to meet certain needs, I'm very afraid that this is only going to disrupt the marketplace and further increase the prices. And I'm not getting an answer to that. Mr. Nazarian, if I may. Please. The chair. Um, I know you have a concern about the issue of supply and, and stockpiling and all of that. Um, and we had conversations and we have done some research. In the early 2000s, there were issues. There were supply chain issues wholesalers trying to buy up more of the drugs. Um, there was even, in 2004, Bristol-Myers Squibb paid $150 million to, to settle an SEC claim that they were doing channel stuffing, which was basically trying to load up wholesalers with drugs so then they could basically say to their stockholders that they were selling more than they were. So there were, there were issues in that supply chain. And one of the responses to the the SEC fine, which was a, a huge amount, was that there was kind of a meeting of the minds, as it's been reported in, in numerous articles, around switching the relationship between the manufacturers and the wholesalers. And that switch was basically to more of a fee-for-service model, where in exchange for having basically more of a cap on how much wholesalers could buy from the pharmaceutical companies, they would pay them a fee for basically doing all the stocking, and that there would be much more transparency about what the inventory was to be able to control it. And so for the big three um, wholesalers, which cover about 90% of the market, there really has been a switch in that business model. And so some of you know the market response, like rather than government regulation coming in, other than the SEC, but that was stock fraud, um, they have been able to figure out themselves how to control this. Because it is in the interest of pharmaceutical companies to get the medications to patients. And they have to have that agreement with wholesalers to get it there. So I think the market has shown that they've been able to really adjust to some of the issues that are happening, whether it's moving to a fee-for-service model or whether, you know, if it's advance notice, they're going to figure out how to do that. There's contracts along the way. And you can put things in contracts to basically avoid a lot of the, the scenarios that you're raising. And I think these are these businesses are, are capable of doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Questions completed, Mr. Nazarian? Yes? Okay, any further questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, um, I, I appreciate on both sides. I mean, this is a complicated issue. You can see by the members here. Um, questions that people had. Um, this is complicated. I think there's a desire, a, a good desire to try to resolve this. Um, and so I appreciate the time and energy that has gone into this. Uh, and, and I appreciate it from the members and from the people who testified both both uh, for and against. Uh, Senator Hernandez, I'm going to let you close. Just a, I think we've covered a lot, so just a brief close would be great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I appreciate the conversation. If anything, at least we were able to have a discussion about a concern that we all have, whether it's the right approach or not. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we're mandating everybody purchase this product. We have to make sure it's incumbent upon us that they have the best price available. I don't believe in regulating prices. I think transparency works. We've heard about value from the opponents. Then let's have that conversation. Because if we're going to really start putting value on medications, there's some that work really, really well. And don't get me wrong, I believe that the pharmaceutical industry plays a very, very important role in the lives of everybody in, the, in this world, in this country. But if we're going to have that conversation, let's talk about value. And I would probably just close with this. This is a quote from um, 
the Vice President of Senior Counsel in the Law Department of a Pharmaceutical Research Manufacturer of America and says, I think it's one way to help. We've been told by payers that being surprised later in the process when payers are setting the rates and doing the calculations they need to do 18 months or so before policies go into effect, it's not helpful for payers to be surprised. Said Jeff Francer, Vice President, Senior Counsel in the Law Department of Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturing of America, in an interview. We feel it's important to get this type of pipeline information to payers more quickly than they are getting it now. And with that, Mr. Chair, I respectfully ask for an I vote. Thank you. We have a motion, which is uh, do pass as amended to appropes. Uh, we have a motion and a second. I'd ask the clerk to please call the roll. Wood? Mainshine? No. Mainshine, no. Bonilla? Burke? Aye. Burke, aye. Campos? Chu? Aye. Chu, aye. Gomez? Hernandez? Lackey? No. Lackey, no. Nazarian? Olson? Patterson? No. Patterson, no. Ridley Thomas? Aye. Ridley Thomas, aye. Rodriguez? Santiago? Steinorth? McCarty? Aye. McCarty, aye. Waldron? And Bonilla. Bonilla? Aye. Bonilla, aye. It is currently five to three. It is on call. Thank you. I know. I know. I was just looking that. Uh, no, I'm, sure, I'm just kidding. I only have three more bills. Yeah. But if you want, I can stay up here and we can talk on each one of them the same length we did on the last think, one. Would you yeah. like that? We're looking for uh, we're looking for more uh, a quicker resolution to the to the next three. Um, so next, Senator Hernandez, if you could uh, proceed with uh, SB 1076.